Good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday to you. Coming from various spots on the East Coast here. Andrew Destin with Jason Mackey. We are not in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, <laughs> Jason, you've got a good view behind you. I've got Manhattan behind me, but I like yours a little bit more. Where are you at these days? Bradenton, Florida, my friend. Bradenton, Florida. And I, I, I love it. I'm excited. We got in yesterday. Um, here with my family. Um, you may have heard that there's a guy, um, Paul Skeens, I believe is his name, the Pirates' number one overall pick. He's starting tonight. I'm here. I will be there. I'm really excited to head over to the park. Been walking around here and doing all kinds of stuff. So, yeah, we're at the, uh, the Spring Hill. I've talked about that place before. They take great care of us and everybody uh, right on the downtown Riverwalk. And I always I tell them I, I am more than happy to plug them and talk about them. So, please, if you come down here, stay here. But – yeah, skiing start, man. We'll get into it. I can't wait. Yeah, I'm so pumped for you. It's going to be a good time. And hey, I mean, you got you got the water behind you. You got the beach ahead of you. So hopefully, uh, in addition to some skiing's time, maybe some R&R time too. But I know I'm getting ahead of myself. We're baseball. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, uh, you're, you're down there holding down the fort, uh, obviously, with all things skiing's related and getting some good minor league coverage there. I'm here with the team in New York um, coming off of last night's game, which I know you were keeping close tabs on. Um, and there's also some Austin Hedges chat to get into. But I guess let's start with last night's game with Priester getting the ball. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, the former first rounder, another tough outing for him. And you you know Quinn as well as anybody. This is a guy who's upbeat, positive, seemingly every moment. He was still that after last night's start. But you can tell I me. Mean, it's starting to get to him a little bit, and I don't, I don't blame him because it was a lot of the same things that have been problematic for him, and it's those one-two counts, leverage counts, where he's not able to put guys away. It's giving up base hits and home runs with two outs. It's stuff that's really frustrating, I'm sure you can speak to, for any pitcher, and it was yeah. a lot of stuff that came to the forefront and seems slightly concerning maybe for Quinn. I mean, Andrew, 9-10 ERA, 28 and two-thirds innings, 18 walks, 23 strikeouts, 311 batting average against – 192 whip. I mean, yeah, it's concerning. It's very concerning for me. Um, I, just because the attitude is down doesn't make this the right move all the time. I, and I just, I wonder what we're doing here. As much as I want to see Quinn around and I really like him as a person, I mean, it's not even about major league team results. It's about what's the best for him. And I don't know if just getting his stuff beaten all over the yard is the best thing for him. I, and, you know, I look at it this way. If they had a full major league rotation, would he – excuse me, I got something going on in my eye. Um, no, if he had, if they had a full major league rotation right now, would he be up here? And I don't think he would be. I don't think he would. And, and, you know, I think he's up here out of need. And if he's doing well, that's fine. But he really isn't. And I, I just feel bad forcing the kid because the results aren't there. I don't know how much it's impacting his development. And he's basically only staying here, I think, because they don't have another option. Now, Luis Ortiz, Rowanzi Contreras is what I've approved. So I wouldn't be surprised if they did something, Andrew. Honestly, I just don't see it happening here. I mean, maybe you give Quinn one more, but it's it hasn't been pretty. You were in the ballpark last night. I mean, tell me about his mood. Tell me about the pitch execution, or it seemed like lack of it. You know, Do yeah. you see any solutions coming from there? Yeah, I mean, there's so many places to start with this one and touched a little bit on it with some of the writing, but there was obviously some that got left on the cutting board uh, kind yeah. of on the floor. But, like, I mean, first off, just with the mood, obviously, with him, I mean, the guy always as respectful as anybody with the media, very forthright and, you know, yeah. taking blame and all those sorts of things. But, you know, we ask him about pitch execution and things like that because not only was the location off for certain pitches, like an elevated fastball that was right down the pipe or – a hanging sinker that didn't drop down enough to guys like Daniel Vogelbach. I mean, um, but the, the thing that kind of stood out to me is with the fastball and sinker usage, those were two things that were wildly different than they had been. And that four-seamer, I mean, it's just something that, you know, he's not a guy who's going to be 95, 96, 97, pumping it past you. And the sinker was something that he had really worked on in those first, uh, I want to say, five starts before the sixth start last night. Um, went away from that a lot yesterday. And instead, it was a lot of, we're going to pump four seam and try to set up the curveball, but he only threw the curveball nine times. And again, I, I feel like I'm a broken record, but like you and I know, I mean, that curveball for Quinn, that's as good of a pitch as he has, as good of a pitch as any young arm can hope to have. It's a great breaking ball for him, but he's not getting to it. And when he's not getting to it and you're having to rely instead on being a four seam guy or instead rely on being that sinker slider guy, I mean, it, it's just, 
I guess what I'm getting to with all those points is that I don't know that we're really seeing Quinn or we definitely yeah. we didn't see him yesterday. It felt like we're trying to see if anything sticks, like throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall to see if any of it's going to work with him. And that wasn't the case last night. It wasn't really him. And he kind of spoke candidly about that of like how frustrating it's been to keep trying different stuff to keep working and keep him a positive mindset. And it's like, it's, he realizes he's close, but he also recognizes this isn't him. And I think that's maybe the most frustrating part, not just for him, but for Pirates fans and for the team at large is that like they're trying this and, you know, they, they think there's another level there. And I'm not one to speak on that and give it a, you know, a claim one way or the other, because it's too early to tell. But I mean, this isn't certainly what they would, uh, would have hoped I would imagine from the call up. Yeah. And I mean, you said it right there. Like, this isn't Quinn. And I don't think this is anything close to what he's capable of doing. They drafted this kid and he was 96, 97. They mm -hmm. drafted this kid. He had elite stuff. You know, he had three pitches and was working on a fourth and has since developed a fifth. And now all of a sudden, we're not using his primary pitch. We're obsessed with sinkers and the velocity has gone down. I'd be willing to bet because of different, I mean, his arm just didn't like get old or tired or his elbow is not throbbing and he's throwing anyway. I mean, a lot of this stuff is mechanical. It's mental. It's stuff they're having them do and worry about and think about. And I just don't like it. I feel like it is, you know, obfuscated who this kid can be, has been in the problem or in the past. And it's caused a bunch of problems, you know, and I, I don't know how you get back to that, frankly. I mean, this is, this was, this is such a bigger picture thing to me where if you remember, you weren't you weren't on the beat. I think you were still at Penn State. You might have been covering Penn State, whatever. They came in here and talked to us about it's going to be this player-centric culture and everything that makes players special, and they're going to be able to do this and you know independently do this, and we're going to cater plan to them. All of a sudden, everybody comes in here. We see them throwing sinkers, and their velocity goes down, and they've got to like dictate everybody's mechanics to them. Why? Why? You know, if Priester's throwing 97 – and he's doing it relatively well, which he was, you know, when there's equivalence for Luis Ortiz or Juanzi Contreras, let him go. Let him go. Accentuate some areas of weakness. You know, if you've got to help a guy develop a changeup, fine, a second breaking ball, whatever. But I just, I'm, I'm wondering what's happening here with Priester and how far from the actual version of Quinn that they drafted, that we saw the next year, the year after that. It just doesn't look like anything, doesn't look anything like that previous guy, Andrew. It doesn't. Yeah, no, and I think he feels that. I really do. And I, I know I'm kind of getting back to this, but it's like there was another quote that kind of stuck with me. It was He was talking about getting ahead in some of those leverage counts and how he wants to be loose and free and let himself go. And it's like he said he feels rigid and stiff. I don't think you want to hear your pitcher saying they feel rigid and stiff in no. two strike counts, right? No, like Ever, ever, yeah. ever, <laughs> ever. So that just – that speaks to where they're at with him. And, and uh, you bring up a good point talking about Ron and Contreras and Luis Ortiz. Ortiz, who's, I think, given up two runs or one run in the last 10 innings. And Contreras is now up there in AAA. I mean, those are guys who had their own struggles roughly a month ago, a month and change ago. Maybe they're knocking on the door. But, I mean, we're, we're sitting there talking to Shelton post game, And it's like, it's a thought that crosses the mind of, hey, do we ask, is it time for Quinn? Like, do we need to, do we need to reevaluate things? The conversation never really went that there. And obviously, Shelton's never going to be that guy to the media. But, like, to us, it's almost like a debate of, is the question worth being asked? Because where are they at with this rotational depth? And you, you've already talked about that extensively. But it's just, that's yeah. where my mind goes, too. Is it's like, are they trotting him out there again because out of necessity? Or is this, hey, we have this plan in mind and this is the way to get the best out of Quinn? I don't know yeah. what the situation is. I, I, I really don't no. know how you <laughs> yeah, and and based, I wouldn't base any of it off of Shelton's answers. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, I, like like Priester, I like him a lot personally, but I, I he doesn't say anything in those situations. Nope. He won't speak critically of a guy. You're not going to get an honest assessment of a player or a situation. Um, and I understand why he does it, but I think when we get into situations like this, where fans want to know and want to have a reaction and and want to believe in something and want to hear an answer and want to hear a solution, like. You know, they're not getting one. They're not getting one and people get mad and they're not, you know, satiated by like a, a sense of urgency being echoed by those inside the team. You know, they're on the outside and they want they want people to feel as emotionally about this stuff as they do. And I think those people feel those emotions. But if those emotions aren't conveyed, then how did the people on the other side know? Anyway, that's a rant for another day.
Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't expect Shelton to say anything too critical of Priester, unfortunately, because I mean, yeah, again, like I'll speak critically of them, of, of Priester. I mean, I'll also give you context and, you know, say that I've known Quinn and his parents since the day he was drafted and, you know, I've covered a lot of him and gotten to know him a lot. And I think he's a great kid, but I mean, there's a lot of great kids that might not be pitching well. And that's, that's what we're seeing. And I'm just, I'm trying to think about what's best for him and how he can best develop. And I, you know, right now, just getting your stuff hit so darn hard because the team doesn't have any other options really isn't the best thing for Quinn Priester. And neither is, you know, pitching in a way that is not tailored to his strengths, which is also what he's doing. Like they, to me, you need to wipe the board clean almost, whether it's this start, whether you're giving another one, you know, send them back, start talking about pitching off your curveball, get back to throwing four seamers, get back to bringing some velocity out, pitch with a bit of an edge. I don't want you stiff. I want you, you know, mean and egotistical on the mound, but they're just so far away from that stuff. Yeah. A lot, lot to keep tabs on, and certainly we'll we'll keep you posted on that front if there's any movement or if uh, they're going to keep trotting them out there for the foreseeable future. But um, as we talk about Quinn Priester, we'll pivot now to um, some other trending topic here in Pirates land. Jason, you wrote about this, um, talking about Austin Hedges. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, this is amazing. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> are you a, like are you a PNC Park fan? I more crap for defending him than I have for William. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, I didn't realize you were a fan at PNC Park. My apologies. Um, but uh, but Austin Hedges, I mean, I'll let, put the ball kind of in your court here, but um, just him talking candidly with Chris Rose, um, talked about the experience at PNC Park and with Pirates fans. Also yep. in your court, Jason. Yeah. So I'll provide the full context. This was after he got booed. Um, Kevin Gorman and I from the Trib were, you know, waiting for him, trying to get him. Um, you know, try to get a reaction, wanted to hear what he had to say about it. I think that's a fair question. Um, and this was, you know, in, in June, right? Like, I think it was about June 17, 18, 19, somewhere in that range, right about the time Davis was called up, frankly. Um, and so he's getting booed relentlessly. And Gorman and I go up to him and, and say, you know, what do you think about getting booed? How, what's your reaction? And he said, no comment. I don't want to talk about it. And you knew that that was in there. You knew what came out yesterday with Chris Rose was in there um, and Hedges does these podcast appearances with Chris Rose and it's it, like he Hedges is fantastic I think Chris Rose's podcast is fantastic it's a really good listen anyway um, so Rose asked him about it and, and there were some interesting quotes in there you, you knew as somebody who was around for this that it was coming out sooner or later just a matter of waiting because that sucked dude that was wild I didn't expect that um, but I think there's some important context around and you know Hedges went on and on. That wasn't all he said. So please check out the story at post-gazette.com. But um, I think there's some important context here that like, I don't blame Hedges. I, I, I get where he's coming from. Um, he was brought here to do a job and did that job and then got booed for doing that job. He was nothing that he wasn't any other place here. Pardon the double negative, but like we knew he wasn't going to be a very good hitter. He wasn't a very good hitter. He was terrible. Um, the entire offense was not his fault. There were so many more problems. A team like the Pirates, the, the meager offensive production, can't stand to have a bat like that in the lineup. And they continue to run him out there as a starter. Meanwhile, you have your two top prospects who are catchers. They're refusing to let one of them catch, and they refused at the time to call both of them up. So it incites fans. And all of that anger got taken out on poor Austin Hedges. And he, he went on to say, like, what is, what's it all my fault? Like, he couldn't believe – how they sort of like everybody all got into it at once. Like what was their group text or something like that? I think was his quote. Um, but you know, I'm glad Austin Hedges said it. I, I'm not defending Hedges. I'm not saying he should have been the pirate starting catcher. Cause I don't believe that they should have turned the page to Andy and Henry sooner than they did. And at least shared reps with Hedges, but just a weird situation. I feel like in a couple of years, we're going to look back at this and just kind of shake our heads and say, like, what are they doing? What happened there? Oh, God, that was terrible. I mean, hopefully you look at it and Andy and Henry thrive here because they're good kids. I like them a lot. But, um, yeah, I just I thought those comments were worth um, bringing to readers, even though they weren't reported by us. There's certainly some context there that involves us. Yeah, no, and it was, I mean, you, you, you kind of hit on all of it there. It's just like it's a situation where, yeah, he was brought in to do said job and maybe the power. I mean, you wrote about this, too. I want to say it was probably two, three weeks ago now about uh, the mishandling of Austin Hedges, um, yep. how they mishandled that situation. It's like that's something that resonates with me is that like 
there was a thought that was put into this that when it happened, when he was signed, I looked at it and said, all right, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. One year, $5 million, I believe. I mean, that's logical. Wait until your guys are ready. And when they are, then you call them up and then you move on from the guy or put him into a backup role, whatever it is. It was just yep. – it was the timing. It was – the reality of Henry raking and then ND finding his groove. It was everything kind of coming all together at once and just creating this perfect storm that I think um, brought out a situation that, yeah, for Austin Hedges, you know, speaking about how tough that was for him mentally, things like that. It's yeah. I, I don't blame the guy. It certainly would have been a tough spot. I can't relate to in any capacity as an athlete in that aspect. Like, yeah, it's, um, I mean, dude, I, I no, no, nobody would have gotten mad if it would have just been Austin Hedges, like, sharing time with Andy Rodriguez. Yeah. And then like, okay, Austin Hedges is going to play until, you know, June or whatever. And we determine, you know, even if you don't say it's super two, okay, it's super two, whatever. And then you bring them up and you play them together. Or you just, you know, and I even understand Andy Rodriguez did not hit a lot early on in Indianapolis. You're going to keep him down. Okay. Henry did bring him up, give him a chance. Like I am all for anybody who earns the opportunity to come up here and play, play him. Play it. If it goes poorly, you can always go backwards. Don't don't tell me about, you know, oh, well, they're going to lose a roster spot or, you know, no, no. I, I just you lose 100 games in back to back seasons. Roster spots should not be. No, nobody has that much of a stranglehold on space, in my opinion. And I don't think that's what we're talking about here. But I just think that the Pirates sort of made this worse for themselves by how adherent they were to Austin Hedges and, you know, propping it up with stuff like pitch framing. I mean, Austin Hedges was a very good defensive catcher. You can look at metrics that otherwise are very helpful that paint him as a good def- the good defensive catcher. Excuse me. But when your offense stinks, you can't have a guy that's hitting 180. Yeah. That's literally what he was, and it took like a flurry toward the end of his tenure here to get to 180. It's just the wrong guy. Uh, and so, I don't know. To me, it's lesson learned. I think in that position, you probably need to prioritize defense a little bit more or just be a little bit more lenient with prospects that theoretically should be able to hit, bring them up here and say, all right, we're going to sacrifice defense here for, for the offense. We still have hedges. He can defend in key situations. If you have to defensively replace somebody late, so be it. I just thought it was the wrong prioritization of things. Yeah, and, and to your point there about bringing guys up, also let them develop as defensive catchers in the big leagues. Which, right, right. I mean, that's the whole point of why your coaching staff is where I it's came at. Up last night with you. Yeah, yeah. It's like why? I mean, if your staff is right up there at the big leagues, you would think in theory. Uh, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. That should be the staff that's best positioned to get guys ready. Yeah, and to bring out the best in them defensively, but. Yeah, what do uh, what, what do I know? I'm just the guy who played catcher in high school. I'm quite far removed from from this standpoint. <laughs> um, but speaking of guys, uh, pretty young ball players. I mean, let's pivot now to the to the Paul Skeens talk. I mean, that's yep. something that I'm keenly interested in. Love to look, looking forward to what you're going to be able to put out based on uh, what we're going to see from Skeens. But coming in here, it's August fifteenth. You're in Bradenton. Skeens yep. coming on the bump tonight. Uh, what, what are you looking forward to? Pardon my um reframing of the shot by the way you, it, people would laugh um i'll pull it up here so i have my i was it, that's my carry-on that i was using to uh put my laptop on to try to frame the shot and i was worried it was gonna follow i, I didn't like what it was looking like so <laughs> i changed that um that's okay we we enjoy that sort of we, stuff we got the water view for long enough there we got it in yeah now, now you get the cloud view <laughs> ah. <laughs> and here let me see if i can I wanted to get the Mike's t-shirt in there too. That's all right. A little taste of home. Um, no, so the Skeens thing's going to be phenomenal, man. I, I'm so excited for that. Um, I My guess would be two innings. I mean, he threw 11 pitches. I think, what, 11 pitches, eight strikes? Or 11 yeah. pitches, 10 strikes? I can't keep track of what was what was 100. Um, but the, the Florida Complex League was something – I. I was talking to somebody yesterday in the airport. Um, I won't say who, because I didn't ask for his uh, permission to use the comments, but somebody in the Pirates organization. Um, and, you know, just sort of about the excitement over Paul's or uh, the Complex League debut and sort of some, not concern, but just like thinking that, well, he might throw 96, might throw 97, you know, first time throwing professionally. You never know what you're going to get, that sort of thing. <laughs> Then he goes out and throws 101. <laughs> yeah. This kid's probably not going to be phased. Um, so I'm excited to uh, chat with him, obviously. Uh, it'll be my second time 
meeting him or, you know, getting to talk to him one-on-one um, or in person, I should say. Anyway, um, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun to go see him pitch live. Should be two innings, should be exciting. Hoping to see some hundreds, maybe a couple breaking balls and uh, get over to Lee Comp Park. Yeah, not not a bad situation you got there. And uh, with, with you bringing up the two innings, I kind of, I guess that I'm definitely getting ahead of myself. So apologies. Um, but on, on that talk, I know on Ben Sherrington's show, he mentioned how 20 innings was kind of what they were looking at for Paul Skeens the rest of the way. Um, I'm not trying to be the math major saying, you know, 20 minus two minus like whatever amount he's already thrown so far. But like yeah. he's there in Bradenton right now. I mean, what's kind of the thought like in your mind? How many, I guess – one, how do you expect this to go in terms of his progression the rest of the year as we sit here on August 15th? And what do you expect the Pirates to do? Because maybe those are two very different things. Like, how would <laughs> how do you how do you anticipate this to go and how would you handle it with okay. uh, some schemes along? So the last time someone asked me that question was Josh Roundtree on Bucko Talk on Saturday morning. And I, I relayed that the Pirates were, you know, at least batting around the idea of him maybe coming up and making a major league appearance this year. Um, that's not going to happen. That is one piece of information I got between um, the answering Josh's question and this. So uh, that was that made its rounds on Twitter. That's not going to happen. I'll start with that. The way I expect this to go, though, and Charrington said, I think you mentioned this under 20 innings the rest of the year. I think you're going to see controlled starts, and I think you're going to see them at multiple locations. Um, would not shock me at all. I, I don't know if he'll do one or two in Bradenton. Um, maybe TBD, depending on how tonight goes. I don't know. But I would expect him to climb at least till Altoona. Um, and again, these are kind of vague answers, but like, you know, I'd go one or two here. I don't, I have not heard about plans of going to Greensboro. Um, it was more like if things go well here, we'll go to Altoona and see where that leaves us. So, I mean, if you go one or two here, let's say two plus three, five, he's got 15 innings left. Do you go two in Altoona? possibly, and then one in Indianapolis. I could see that, um, get him a taste of everything. I think the idea is to sort of set the table for next year. I don't think he'll make the major league team out of camp, but I think he can position himself very well to whenever they get past the, you know, it's a couple weeks to maintain that extra year of control on the back end of the contract once they pass that, basically the end of April. I, I would expect him up here if, you know, again, if if he pitches right. the incredible way we're sort of all expecting Obviously, anything less of that is going to change the timeline. But, yeah, that's what I would see. You know, one or two here, two in Altoona, something like that, three in Altoona. I mean, maybe a finish in Indy. I think that's a that's a TBD. But I, I would certainly expect him in Altoona this summer. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that, that timeline, it's obviously very different prospects because it's a pitcher versus a hitter. But the name that kind of came to mind to me when talking about, like, how he's going to get brought along, it seemed not terribly dissimilar from, like, what the Cubs did with Chris Bryant. Yeah, uh, you know how they kind of handled that, and then when the start of the season came, how this was a guy who did great in spring training, pushed the envelope, but it was still, hey, we got to wait a couple of weeks and get to the end of April. That was kind of my thought was maybe that title will go with Skeens. So interesting to hear you kind of say a similar point. But is it going to be funny whenever Skeens is throwing like 101, gives up no runs in spring training, and is just crushing guys? And they're like, yeah, we need to work on his development of, um, I don't know, <laughs> like what are you going to come up with? The gyro slider. That's what we the need. Gyro slider. <laughs> That's yeah, the answer. Fork ball isn't quite where we need it to be. Does he throw a fork ball? No. That's the point. We're gonna we gotta teach him a fork ball. He, he we need to find a four a, or a three seam fastball to, to work out. I don't know. The key is he needs to face eerie sea wolves hitters. That's how he. <laughs> that's how he develops. That's right. Then his knuckleball is still uh, spinning a little bit more than we would like. Um, I, I was digging through that, by the way. I, this takes me back because I was actually living in D.C. at the time it, to the Strasburg debut. Um, you know, drafted June 9, 2009. Made his MLB debut June 8, 2010. Did he do it again? I mean, that's that's kind of what we're looking at here, right? Like, you know, uh, next year in June, I think it could be earlier. Who knows? But, you know, you also want to make sure the kid's healthy. I, I don't think that like Strasburg's arm and elbow issues and stuff were because he debuted so soon. I think there were bigger problems, but I think you probably want to, you know, if you're the pirates and you see anything at all, that's alarming about Skeens's, you know, 
physiology or how he's moving his body or whatever, you probably do want to get that worked out now. So you don't have those long-term issues, but I don't know, man, I'm as, I'm as excited as anybody else to watch a kid pumping one Oh one past people in the way I think he can pitch. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, I- I will stay in the moment. I'm just going to say to you, enjoy the heck out of that. I know it's going to be a blast down there in Bradenton and uh, looking forward to the coverage. Definitely. And uh, we'll, we'll keep you posted. Yeah. What's up? Enjoy New York too. I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. angry about this. Cause I I've never been to city field every single year I've been on the beat. It's been, you know, new bias had it and perf Persac had it. I've never gotten the darn New York trip. Uh-huh. Um, maybe next year, maybe next year we'll, We'll trade New York. You, you go to San Francisco and a, what is it? San Francisco, LA, something out there, but you should be going out there. Um, I'm taking New York next time. Though. Good. I'll take that trade. Consider it done. <laughs> it went through the MLB The Show trade formulator. Yeah. I'm all, I'm... <laughs> all right. Awesome, man. Well, hey, good talk. You enjoy it down okay. south. We'll keep it down. We'll hold down the fort up here and uh, we'll catch you all next time for our next Pirates baseball breakdown. And be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay updated with our latest content. If you haven't already, check out our subscription deal in the description. Six dollars, six months of access. There's plenty of sports news to keep up with, and you don't want to miss it. Catch you all next time. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you enjoyed the video, please like it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out our Apple Podcast channel for more podcast content. Click below for a special deal of 99 cents for a three-month subscription to the Pittsburgh Post Gazette.